You can buy tickets uh, for all sorts of activities, right? Movies, plays, concerts, sporting events, travel. But it's always better if someone else buys your ticket. Uh, when nothing more is required of you than just showing up. You know, you just present your ticket at the door and you're welcomed and, and shown your way to uh, a seat reserved for you. And in one sense, I think the gospel of Jesus Christ is sort of like a ticket. I mean, through his death and resurrection, he paid the price for us to enter his eternal kingdom. And so when you believe in him, you're granted admission entirely by his grace. We do nothing to earn it, to pay for it. We simply receive it by faith. But unlike a ticket for some event, you can't simply set the gospel aside and forget about it until you stand at the threshold of eternity and need it. That's not how it works. When we genuinely understand and believe the gospel, it transforms us. It penetrates our hearts. It changes the way that we view life. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. He says, For the love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So what does it really mean to live for Jesus? To live for him, in one sense, means becoming like him. His mission, his message must become our mission in life and our message. And so in chapters 14 all the way through 19 of, of, of his gospel, Luke recounts a, a series of stories that I think are, are designed to bring about that kind of transformation in his readers. Uh, he's talking about the, the final weeks before the crucifixion. And as we've seen previously in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has, has been training his disciples. In the most recent section we looked at, he was confronting his critics um, but these conversations, I think, really bring out the, the burning passion of what I'm calling the gospel-shaped heart. And so my prayer is that our study of these chapters over the coming weeks will kindle that same kind of fire, that same passion in us. Uh, when my wife and I were first Married, we volunteered to teach a Sunday school class for three-year-olds for an entire year. And, and one of the big lessons uh, from that class for me was that you can never have enough Legos. Um, you know, that was the thing we'd do as kids were arriving. Um, we'd pour, dump some Legos out, or th actually those were the little kids, so we had the Duplos, right? We'd dump them out on the table while we were waiting for, for other kids to arrive. But there was always a fight, right? Because after a few minutes of building, they'd begin to run out of blocks. And, and inevitably, there'd be an argument between the kids. And that impulse in us never goes away. Right? We always want to get our fair share or to get more than somebody else. Um, and we, and, and it, we begin to desire more than blocks or toys, right? I mean, it's, it ends up becoming money and possessions or even more intangible things like acceptance and attention and power and influence. Our, our hearts are, are sinful. And so there's this impulse to be, uh, to be greedy. But the gospel rebukes those selfish desires. Right? First, it, it shows us that we should set our hearts on something greater. The real treasure is to have a relationship with God. And, and, and the gospel tells us that Christ sacrificially gave his life to bring us into that relationship. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul puts it this way. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Now Paul's saying those things in a spiritual sense, 
But he uses that argument of Christ's generosity uh, to uh, inspire the Christians in Corinth to be generous financially toward others. But again, generosity is not just financial. It extends all those things that we can covet, that we can be greedy about, and we can be generous with those things as well. And so it really gets down to this core issue of our hearts, of, of caring for people, of being selfless. Right? In Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5, Paul puts it this way, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about Christ's death on the cross for us, right? Is humbling himself, taking on uh, humanity. And so this, this humble, generous, Christian, Christ-like spirit is risky, right? Caring for people can be costly. We know it costs Jesus his life, but even in his ministry before the crucifixion, he's already challenging people to have that heart, to take this risk. And so Luke 14, verses 1 through, all the way down through 24, tells us about a conversation that Jesus has with some Pharisees over dinner. And toward the end of the passage, uh, verses 15 through 24, he ends up telling them a parable about the gospel. Uh, and we'll save that for, for the next time that we, we look at Luke. But uh, Jesus leads into that teaching uh, first by talking about this generosity. At least that's how I'm summing it up. So in verses 1 through 14, I think Jesus reveals uh, three risks of humble generosity, or we can even call it Christ-like generosity. And so as we examine this conversation, start into it this morning, I want to challenge you to consider whether you are taking these risks. Let the words of Christ here shape your heart, your outlook toward people. The first risk that comes out in the passage is about risking approval. People are always watching, right? And they always have opinions. I mean, that habit's just part of fallen human nature, but um, smartphones and social media seem to amplify all of that. I mean, in times past, people just aired their complaints uh, through personal gossip sessions. <laughs> Right? But now it's like they broadcast it online. They post pictures or video for the entire world to see. And, and sometimes, sometimes their scorn is justifiable, but uh, people are also quick to condemn, too quick sometimes. They don't necessarily understand the facts. But even when they do, their standards may not align with God's standards. So... The reason I bring that up is because as you try, if you try to be generous and try to help someone in some way, you may risk losing people's approval for doing it. Now, Jesus takes that risk repeatedly during his ministry, and we find him doing it here again in verses 1 through 6 of Luke 14. Take a look. Follow along with me as I read. Luke writes, One Sabbath... When he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now, if this story sounds familiar to you, it's, it's probably because this is the, the third occasion in Luke's gospel in which Jesus dines with the Pharisee. And it's the fourth account of him healing on the Sabbath. 
right? It might seem a little repetitious. Uh, I mean, Jesus certainly knows that their response is not going to be positive here. Uh, but we need to bear in mind, first of all, that uh, these encounters happen in different places. Jesus is traveling around to different locations. And furthermore, though it may seem repetitive, I think Luke includes each of these stories in his, his gospel because in each case he's bringing out a slightly different lesson, something different that he wants us as his readers to, to get. Uh, and so in working through the earlier Sabbath passages, uh, we've talked a lot about the spirit of that Old Testament a Sabbath commandment. But here, as we look at this passage, in light of the rest of the conversation that we'll see uh, in a moment, I think Jesus is challenging the Pharisees here to care for people enough that they would risk losing the approval and acceptance of others. I mean, it seems that Jesus miraculously heals this man before they even sit down to dinner. <laughs> Right? It's like he walks into the house and, oh, there's a sick man. Let me heal them. Okay, let's have dinner now. Uh, I mean, it just kind of has, it, it, ha it seems to happen so quick the way that Luke describes it. And he doesn't say much about the man. He doesn't tell us why he's there. Uh, he, he, it's, he says he has dropsy, or today we might say edema. Right? It's the, the swelling of the arms and legs. It's often caused by congestive heart failure, kidney disease, or cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, and so the man doesn't seem to be a Pharisee. Uh, he might be a servant who just happens to be there, or maybe he's someone from the community who, who heard that Jesus was there and he came because he wanted to be healed, although he never asks. At least Luke doesn't say that. Um, it's, there's a slight chance that the Pharisees might have brought him there to test Jesus. They do that sometimes. Uh, but the rest of the conversation with this particular group uh, doesn't seem to suggest that level of animosity. So Jesus takes the initiative, right? He asks them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And then in verse 5, after he heals the man, he asks them to consider how they would respond if their son or their ox were to fall into a well on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath commandment, if you go through the Old Testament and see all the ways it's expressed, it's not that specific uh, in prohibiting something like that. But this whole discussion over the Sabbath and all the rules arises because uh, the different Jewish rabbis try to enforce their applications of the law. Right? There, so the commandment's there, and then they say, well, that applies to this. And then all of a sudden, that takes on the force of a commandment in and of itself. And, and, and so scholars tell us that the most extreme rabbis at the time, down in the, the, what's called the Qumran community, it's known for its uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, they actually did prohibit people from, from helping their son or, the, or their ox on the Sabbath. They were that rigorous. Uh, but, but the Pharisees are, are probably not that extreme. Uh, they would still disapprove. They would still be very uncertain about doing anything like that, though. So Jesus phrases the question on a very personal level here. He wants them to think about it. To, he wants them to, to examine their own hearts. You know, it's as if he's asking, would, would your love for your son compel you to risk people disapproving of you doing something on the Sabbath? And if so, if you would do it for your son, would you do it for your ox, for your animal? And if you would do it for your ox, I think this is the point, how can you be so unloving so as to disapprove when Jesus helps someone? Right? The whole idea is, shouldn't we care enough about people to risk the crowd's disapproval? Right? It's not really a violation of the commandment. It's just the question of what people think about the commandment. And Luke tells us they couldn't reply. Right? Jesus' question was penetrating into their hearts. Now, I, I doubt, you know, we probably won't face scrutiny over helping someone on the Sabbath. We don't live in that same cultural setting. Uh, but People might look down on us for, for helping in other ways. I mean, some religious people might look down upon us for befriending people whose lives are given over to certain sins, 
right? I mean, that happened to Jesus. He faced accusations. Luke chapter 7, verse 34 tells us, uh, he says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Right? Would, you, would you risk showing kindness to someone that is an outcast in society? Would you be kind to a prostitute, to a drug dealer? Or what about someone on the other end of the social spectrum? What about somebody who's grown wealthy from taking advantage of people, exploiting them in business? Would you associate with that person? Are you willing to show a generous spirit toward the people that others avoid? And we can certainly say this, with whomever we interact, you can be sure that you'll face disapproval from the crowd, from the world, if we share God's truth. And, and, and yet, telling someone the good news of salvation in Christ is the most generous thing we can do. But the world doesn't see it that way, right? We need to remember Paul's words in Galatians 1.10. I love, love this verse. He says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. The gospel generously offers us God's approval because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And so with his approval, we have no need to, to please other people. We don't have to be bound by that. The gospel compels us to show that same generosity that God has shown toward us to others. So we, we should speak the truth in love and meet pressing needs no matter what other people think of us for doing it. We need to be a faithful servant of Christ. There's a second risk that I see here in the passage and it's uh, risking recognition. Uh, I mean, you, know, you may not chase after the spotlight in a, in a literal sense, uh, but I think we all crave recognition, uh, popularity, right? acceptance in that sense. I mean, and again, living in the internet age only magnifies that pursuit. I mean, it used to be a big deal to get your name in the local newspaper, but now people become worldwide sensations overnight from a comment or a picture or a video that goes viral. Uh, I mean, the gap between everyday person and celebrity seems to get smaller and smaller. But on the other hand, our pursuit of recognition might be as simple as getting your boss to acknowledge your work or getting your name on the right list at school. And when we're desperate for recognition, it seems like the pettiest things take on this exaggerated significance in our minds. That's what Jesus observes here among this group of Pharisees as they choose their places at dinner. And he argues that a truly generous spirit cares enough for others to, miss, to risk missing out on their recognition. Take a look at verses 7 through 11 here in Luke 14. Luke tells us, now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, Jesus is not introducing a new idea with this parable, this story. Right? The Pharisees should have known it well because the same idea is in the book of Proverbs. Solomon presents a very similar scenario in uh, Proverbs 25, verses 6 through 7. He says, 
Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Right? Different, same principle, different setting. And so, in fact, when, as we go through the book of Proverbs, it, it often warns about the dangers of pride. Of, it uses the word haughty eyes. Right? Proverbs 6, 17 even calls it an abomination before the Lord. Why is that? Why does God find it so offensive when we have that self-exaltation kind of mindset? Well, in a sense, every sin can be traced back, back to that desire to be exalted over others. I mean, it was that desire that prompted Satan's rebellion against God. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 to 14 is written all the way back eight centuries before Christ, but it's part of a prophecy condemning the king of Babylon. And, and as Isaiah describes, uh, as, as he, he, he reveals that prophecy, he, he describes the rebellion of an angelic being. Uh, and so most scholars attribute this to, uh, to Satan. It says, uh, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So the question is, you know, if, if that's where your heart is, if it's always about getting ahead, always about being first, where does that pursuit of prominence stop? I mean, it may seem insignificant when it comes out in like a sibling rivalry or just racing to the best seats. But that impulse, you know, it morphs into this obsession with self-promotion that can infect everything we do. I mean, we see it even in the church. We can just be so consumed with getting ahead. And when that happens, we dare not risk helping anyone else, right? We push them aside. We, we criticize and put people down. And if that doesn't work, we might even resort to, to violence, right? I mean, that's, wasn't that the root of it with Cain and Abel? So Jesus advises us that those who humble themselves will be exalted. Right? He tells the whole story about the, the wedding feast, but he's really getting at that final verse there, the, the principle of it. Later in the New Testament, James takes that same principle and applies it to our relationship with God. I think that's what Jesus was directing them toward. And this is a little bit of a longer passage, James 4, verses 6 through 10, but I think the whole thing helps us grasp this idea. He says of God, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So James says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, right? Because it's his temptation. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And he says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So part of the idea here is that no human recognition will ever be enough. The real recognition that we crave only comes from God. And so we must humble ourselves before him, like James says, resisting Satan's temptation to, to grasp at prominence by our own efforts. Because when we humbly choose to wait upon God's recognition in eternity then it's really not such a big deal to let someone else have the best seat, right? We can be generous. We can be gracious and magnanimous when we're not in first place. We can brush it off because that's not what I'm living for, right? It's for the Lord's recognition. And so being humble before the Lord frees us to put our recognition at risk for the sake of being generous. 
One more risk that comes out in the passage, and it's the risk of influence. People say it's all about who you know, right? To move forward, you have to have relationships with powerful, influential people. You have to be part of the in crowd and take advantage of those relationships. And maybe, maybe you don't think quite that way, but, but we all have some group with whom we identify, right? And we tend to ignore those on the outside. I mean, even the church can become that, right? We stick with people who make us comfortable, who benefit us in some way. And of course, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were the in crowd, so to speak. I mean, they were the, the spiritually elite people of first century Jewish society. And, and yet, they keep inviting Jesus over to dinner as he travels from place to place, but they do it because they want to make their own judgment on him. They want to pass judgment on him to see if he really fits with them and their ideas. And so what Jesus does here at this dinner party, he's, he's just confronted them about where they're sitting at the table, right? And then he turns to, to the host, and he calls him out. And he offers him this challenge, calling him to a generosity that is willing to risk that influence and advantage. Take a look at verses 12 through 14. It tells us, He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now this, this concept of, of, of the resurrection was a, big, was a big issue for the Pharisees. It was central to their beliefs. It's one of the things that separated them from the Sadducees. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. That's why they were sad, you see. Yeah. Now, the clearest explanation, some of you are going to be thinking about that all afternoon. <laughs> the, the clearest expression of, of the resurrection in the Old Testament is found in, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And it says, uh, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And it says, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so Jesus is challenging his host at this dinner to evaluate his guest list in light of eternity. I mean, since this man is a ruler of the Pharisees, it's safe to assume that most of his guests are probably from that group. And, and he's, he's a ruler, so he was probably elected to that role. And so maintaining relationship with, relationships with those people, that's a politically smart move. Right? It's to his advantage. But Jesus says, invite the poor, invite the crippled, the lame, the blind even though he won't gain any tangible benefit from them. He would probably consider those people a waste of his time and resources. But the point here that Jesus gets at at the end there is that the benefit comes in eternity. Now, Jesus talks about uh, the importance of that kind of generosity on another occasion uh, it's, it's what's often called the, the sheep and goats judgment. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 25. And, and he, he's talking about the end times there. And he says the Son of Man will, will come in his glory and he'll, he'll separate the nations like a shepherd short, sorting sheep from goats. Right? And, and the idea in, the, in the, the parable, if you read it, is uh, the sheep inherit the kingdom, but the goats are cast out. And the difference between them is seen in their generosity. That's the identifying characteristic. And so Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40, tells us that the Son of Man will say, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. 
I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And it says, and then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And they say, when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And then it says, the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, we don't earn our way into Christ's kingdom by doing good deeds. We receive this inheritance through God's grace by faith. But when we show generosity in ways that don't produce any immediate benefit for ourselves, we're demonstrating that we really get the gospel, right? We're demonstrating that our faith is real, that the gospel is shaping our heart. That's what we're talking about. Being willing to be generous, even when it doesn't benefit us, to risk that influence, that advantage. So is your life marked by this kind of generosity? Are you, are you willing to risk? Do you, do you routinely risk the loss of people's approval? the loss of recognition, the loss of influence. Because if not, are, then the question is, are we really being generous or are we just doing it in token ways to make ourselves feel good? Maybe we need to repent of our selfishness. It's so easy to succumb to the world's self-centered mindset. It's all around us. Can you think of some setting in life where, where you need to be more generous? Maybe, maybe there's a particular individual. Maybe it's a situation at work or at school where you need to show kindness to someone that no one else does. Would you commit to taking that risk? Would you take that step? And again, it's important to understand that this generosity that we're talking about really has to be a response to God's saving grace. We'll talk more about that when we look at that next part of the passage in Luke 14. But if you've never believed, don't misunderstand, don't hear this as just a call to be a good person. That's not, uh, that's not what this is about. Right? For this transformation to take place in your heart, it starts by believing the gospel that good news that Jesus risked everything to save you from your sins, to give you a place in his eternal kingdom. And so because of his generosity, then we respond and reflect that. We conform our lives to what he's like. If you want to learn more about his saving work and what it, how it shapes our lives, I'd encourage you to read more from Philippians chapter 2. I quoted from that chapter earlier. My prayer is that the grace of God would flow through us in this kind of risky generosity.